like to know more about First Southern Baptist Church of Scottsdale or become a member of our church, join Pastor Chad for our next First Steps class on Sunday, June 11th at noon. Lunch will be provided, so sign up at the Next Steps table or the events page of our website. Our next business meeting will be held on Sunday, June 4th at 1215 in the Worship Center. Make plans to join us. Good morning, church. For those of you who don't know, some of you may not, I'm uh, Josh, the family pastor here. Started January 1st. Thank you. Um, And so it's kind of my honor and privilege to actually be able to speak um, and share a message with you guys this morning. But I'm going to start off, maybe not necessarily with something you are be used to, but I'm going to start off talking about, so I've been in ministry for over 20 years, thank you, and in those 20 years, obviously it's got to a long process, a long step to get here. God has been working through me constantly, um, especially the last couple of years. But this all started way, way, way back. And when I was 19, um, I had a mentor, uh, a leader, a youth pastor in my life that saw something in me that most of the people didn't see. He saw that I was going to be in ministry. He was very confident with that, and he worked with me. So one time, uh, he decided, he's like, hey, I want you to come with us. We're going to go, and we're going to leave this worship service, and we're going to have a good time. We're going to go up to Prescott. I want you to come with me. I'm like, sure. I'm 19, that's fine. What am I going to do, not work my pizza job? They'll be okay. So I decided I'm going to go. Not knowing that it was kind of a trap a little bit. So when I get up there, he goes, hey, just let you know, at the end of our worship time, we're going to have like, we're going to have a gospel presentation. And there's like a hundred some junior high and high school students that'll be up there. And a lot of them will be hearing this for the first time. I'm like, okay, sounds good. Getting a little nervous, but sounds good. As the end of that presentation, I want you already to be outside. There's a massive boulder and a tree, a big tree. I want you to be standing there. Everyone's going to exit out that way, and we're going to tell them to stop by and talk to you if they have any questions about what we presented. I was like, okay. Yes, I'll do that. Obviously a little nervous, but okay, I can do this. Like I, at that point, I was like, God's preparing me for something big in my life. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I'm sure you guys can all relate to that. But like, I trust this guy. He's my mentor. He's taking care of me. He got me through a lot. This is what he needs. I'm going to go for it. So what ends up happening is I'm standing here. Service ends. Uh, very emotional. Very awesome worship. Everyone's like, all the students are into it. They present the gospel in a very clear way. I was like, oh my gosh, that was powerful. Right? I come outside. I'm doing my thing. And everyone is exiting. They're just walking right by me. They didn't mention my name, so they're all kind of looking at me like I'm crazy. And I'm just standing there, just awkwardly, just holding up a tree and a boulder. All right? And as everybody's walking by, I'm realizing that there's probably one person he, because he was in our group, that he wanted me to share with. And so, take a deep breath. I'm like, okay. I walk out, and um, a 6'4 offensive senior lineman, way bigger than me, um, walks up, and he's just sobbing. He's just sobbing. He's crying. He's sobbing, and he just hooks his big old head in my shoulder. I was like, this has got really real. So the fun part about the story is I'm going to share two parts. I will let you know that in this moment, if you could ever be the worst person ever to share the gospel in your whole life, I probably accomplished that. I was confused, I didn't know what to say, I was nervous. Everything you can think about when it comes to personally sharing the gospel, which I knew and had just heard very clearly, was all gone. And he's just staying there and he's just he's like nodding his head, trying to understand, but like, oh, I'm destroying this, this is so bad, how am I so confused? But still, every time I talk, I'm confusing myself. So we're going to stop there for right now. Remind me to go back to that story. You guys would be very confused if I don't. Um, and we're going to go through hope in the dark. Um, now, as we've been walking through the book of Revelation, um, uh, if you guys have been here, Chad has done an amazing job kind of sharing that, uh, pointing out different things about the end times um, and the second coming. 
and the seven churches and what that in theory is going to look like, but how that's complicated and we have to fall back, right? And we have to fall back in the Old Testament, right? So don't have your phone open when you're reading the end times. Have your Bible open to Revelation and your Bible open to Daniel and other Old Testament verses. Use this as your source, not this as your source. But we're going to pause right here. Because as you can see, if you know anything about the end times, it's about to get really, really, really crazy. Really hairy. And it's very clear. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to pause and we're going to look at Matthew. And when we look at Matthew, I want you guys to talk about, Matthew talks about the great tribulation, talks about Jesus' return, and the end times a lot. There's parables, there's stories, there's Jesus' words. But let's, real quick, I want you guys to focus on what we know. Focus on what we know. Because, again, the end times and the book of Revelation would be very confusing if we let all the other voices go and we don't focus on what we know. So I'm just going to skim these before we dive deeper. Matthew 24, 14 and 15. The gospel is to be proclaimed. The gospel is to be proclaimed by us believers. It's our job, our command, our commission to tell people about Jesus. We know that. That's all over the Bible. Matthew 24, verse 21. It is going to be so bad in the end times, that there's been no other time that has been this bad. Nothing before and nothing after will be as bad as it is. And Matthew goes through this. It's going to be such horrible times. If you look at verse 23, 24, same chapter, as we have heard many times, right, through Revelation, false prophets, or even just people thinking that they know when the Messiah is going to come, or announcing they are Messiah, or has arrived, our job is to not believe them. Because it's very clear in the Bible, but what do we know? That no one knows when Jesus is coming back. We know Jesus is coming back, but no one knows when Jesus is coming back. And then this passage 24, or chapter 24, verse 27, it says that Jesus is going to come back like lightning. Lightning. Quick and unexpected. Lightning. We can describe lightning in other ways, but that's one way to do it. Quick and unexpected. Again, we don't know when it's going to happen. So these are things we know about. Um, I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to let you guys know a little bit about me. Since Chad was very honest the other day about his obsession with Dr. Pepper, I like Dr. Pepper too, um, and how it might be a little unhealthy. Okay? I love hockey. And yes, I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, but I still love hockey, okay? I love hockey as, uh, to know as much that um, I started a floor hockey league at uh, the church with student ministry. It got very weird, very competitive, very awesome. And I love hockey. I would play hockey. I would watch hockey. I would listen to hockey. I, like, I love hockey. Right now is playoff hockey. Now, I would say I'd get very excited about playoff hockey because my team's in it. But again, I'm from Arizona. So I have Arizona teams. So if you're from Arizona and like Arizona teams, you understand where I'm going with that. But I, I love hockey. And there was a game on the other night, and it went to four overtimes. So they played a game. They were tied. They played another period of a game. They were tied. They played another period of a game. They were tied. Played another period of a game. They were tied. And in the fourth overtime, they're still tied. No one scored. I'm on the edge of my seat, even though these teams aren't really teams I care about. I'm just I'm excited. This is awesome. Right, and 20 seconds left before that period ends, and they go to almost the longest hockey game that's ever existed. Right, someone makes a turnover and they have an open shot and they score. And it is the Florida Panthers. Just, okay, I'm just telling that because of the reference. They're the road team. The team they're playing is Carolina. So these poor people in Carolina kept their kids up until like midnight to watch this game, to watch their team lose. And I've been to a hockey playoff game before, which is going to say how old I am because how is that even possible? Guys don't make playoffs. And I've been before and I understand this feeling where you're just like, what just happened? I just watched a four-hour hockey game and the wrong team won. And we're all just sitting there going, right? But I love hockey. I do. 
But as that game ended and so shocking, right, is why I'm illustrating Jesus is coming back as lightning. It was over like that. Completely unexpected. There it is. You know it's going to end. They might play another four periods, but it's going to end. We know Jesus is going to come back, but it's going to be completely unexpected. We also know that it's going to be a celebration because we already know who won. So let's dive a little deeper. We're going to be in Matthew 24. I'm going to read through this, uh, 36 through 39. But concerning the, that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as we were the days of Noah, so will be coming the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and even giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so it will be like the coming of the Son of Man. So again, it's, we're emphasizing right here, number one, like we don't know when Christ will come. But we're pausing here because I want you guys to see the Noah reference. Yes, we've been studying Revelation. Now we're in Matthew, and now we're going to look at Noah when it comes to end times. It's all going to make sense, I promise. So I love Chad's concept of the big idea. Because I'm a simple man too, and if I can focus on one point, it'd be great. So I have a big idea. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Don't get that confused. Ex expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. This had to be Noah's mindset, right? The man is building an ark. What's an ark? That was his question, right? And he's going to stop a flood. What's a flood? Well, it's water. What, what, what we, this has to be his idea. I'm attempting this for God. Because I expect God to work through this. But here you see people around this time, while Noah's building this massive ark, go through Genesis, you can read all about it and get the dimensions and everything. They didn't give God's message of salvation a thought. They're just living their life. But it's walking through life every day, eating, drinking, getting married, celebrating with her family, like nothing's happening. Meanwhile, a 600-year-old man is building an ark and telling them that that's their salvation. They ignored his message, right, over and over again. And they, they don't understand the great tribulation is coming, right? They're going to have judgment coming. They're acting like they're floodproof. And I know we look back and we're like, oh, well, yeah, that's, they were just not smart. But if we really think about it, as believers, we kind of act like God's message isn't important to everyone else. We could finish this Bible study, this sermon, next week and meet the whole time. And we still wouldn't cross and go and break through enough passages that points out that Jesus came to save the world and we are his messengers. That's our command. And I get verse after verse after verse can point about God's love is for everyone and it's our job to share it. Again, we can go over and over again. Another crazy thing about this passage is as you read through this passage, you realize that even though this time was known for wickedness and sin and horrible behavior, which is why God is bringing a flood, that's not mentioned. What's mentioned is the culture of the day and Noah's reaction. And that's why we're looking at this when it comes to the end times. Noah's an example of how we should react to a culture that is ignoring God's message of love. Or just doesn't care about the gospel. So you look through, um, again, skimming over, we're going to break down another passage in a minute, but Genesis 7, 6 and 7 talks about Noah was alone in his faith. 
Noah was alone in his faith. He was all by himself. Right? He knew people. Right? His family was going to be involved. But he ended up filling the ark with all animals. And Noah was alone in his faith. Yeah, that has to be scary. He also had to have doubts. If you're working so much to accomplish something for God and you feel like no one cares or there's no support, right? I can tell you, you feel doubts. You don't understand why you're being chosen. You don't feel like you're doing a good job of what God has told you to do. But then he's looking around and there's even more doubt. People don't care what he's doing. And the last thing you see very clearly is salvation is in God alone. We cannot say that Noah didn't try to share this message. We cannot say that Noah failed at what he did. With God, he did attempt great things for God. Right? But everyone missed the ark. Everyone missed salvation. Everyone missed their chance to not die in a flood and continue on with God. They missed it. And you look back and goes, Noah must have been really bad at this. That's not it. That's not it. Right? But the salvation was in salvation alone. The ark didn't leave, and then God didn't say, well, there's a mini ark for the people who, you know, didn't figure it out. No, salvation was in God and God alone through this ark. Uh, if you go with me to Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. This is a longer passage, but bear with me. I want you guys to understand this parable. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. For it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. To the one he gave five talents, to the other two, to the other one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received these five talents went once and traded with them. And he made five more talents. So also he will, so also he who had two talents made two more talents. But he who received one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled the accounts with him. And he who received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here, I have made you five more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much more. Enter into the joy of your master. And it goes on through the story, and you understand, right? The master is Jesus. We, believers in Christ, are the servants. This parable shows that God is asking us to represent him, right, until he returns. The talents show us that Christians are equipped with God's word, the Holy Spirit, and spiritual gifts. This parable shows us the seriousness of sharing Christ. To embracing this. To understanding this. And living for God. Now, there's this two parts of just verse 21 that I love. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Like Noah... Standing alone and still trying to attempt great things for God, we're like the believers in this parable. 
commanded to represent him. Even though it's hard and unpopular, and what we're going to be facing in the end times is the hardest thing we've ever faced. It's our job to stay faithful and hold on to the gospel, to share the gospel, and know that we've been equipped to share it. The Great Commission in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, Jesus' last words to his disciples is to go and make disciples. He didn't say, wait for me to come back. I got more for you. He said, go and make disciples. And a lot of times I think we soften this by saying it's a commission. When I think a harsher word for me is it's a command. God is commanding us to go share his love. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Noah has to feel that. We have to feel that when we're attempting great things for God. But I also love, we keep going, we read 21 again. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much more. Enter into the joy of your master. Share your master's joy. Share the joy of Christ with people. But knowing in that, God's joy is the blessing of a kingdom that reigns forever. God's joy is to see his creation show his love. God's joy is, people, joy is that people know him, trust him, serve him, and worship him. When someone comes to Christ, when you're involved in any of that at all, when you're attempting great things for God, you are sharing in the master's joy. You are sharing in the master's joy. The gospel should be proclaimed. Um, I got time. Real quick, I'm going to brag. So I think we hear the word joy. There's times in our life that we're grateful for. And I think we should be grateful for them. And we should give honor to God for them. But this is another level. Right? So for instance, my youngest daughter, she got cancer. And she had three brain surgeries and, and over that year and had to do a little radiation. She's alive and well and doing awesome. Years later, there's nothing left. Right? I celebrate that. I'm joyful for that. I'm joyful for her attitude during that. I actually encourage my faith. She's nine years old. At one point, we're asking her how she feels. And she goes, because she just found out he had to have another surgery. I feel great. I trust God. He loves me. I like, I'm over here, how I'm explaining everything to her, and she's over here telling me about God's love. Right? I'm joyful for that. But again, when it comes to sharing the master's joy, we're talking about a celebration that is for eternity. We're talking about somebody coming to Christ, all the angels celebrating singing praises to God for that one salvation. That's the joy we're talking about. That's the joy we can be a part of. This is a joy that we don't know how to be a part of. We be a part of this by attempting great things for God. We're a part of this by being bold in our faith, even though, even though it's scary. You're going to probably hear this stuff a lot from the church soon about something we want our church to be about. Loving deeply, sharing the gospel boldly, impacting, impacting the community with the hope of Jesus. We know through studying the Bible, that Daniel, Matthew, Revelation, and more, right, the end times, the second coming, it's going to be tough. We know this. Right? We also know who's already won. We also know that God has already conquered sin. We also know the gospel is the news that is for everyone, and we've been commanded to share that. So again, when you look through the book of Revelations, when you try to study the end times, when you think about the great tribulation, instead of being overwhelmed with how scary and fearful and crazy and confusing it would be, focus on the aspect that we've been equipped to share and love people 
from God and talk about Christ as we follow him. Um, I don't know if you guys have this slide, Hebrews 10, 23. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who was promised is faithful. Hold on. Retain. Keep. Possess. We're encouraged to hold on to hope. The hope we're holding on to is Christ our Savior. And that is the promised faithful one. So when God is saying, hey, I'm going to leave here, and there's this neighbor that I've wanted to have a conversation with, and I know it's awkward, I'm going to realize that I'm attempting great things for God. Because I expect him to do great things through it. And he's faithful. But what if I'm like Pastor Josh, and I stumble and do the worst gospel presentation known to man when he's 19 years old? We have to know that we are attempting great things for God, right? But God's going to be the one who accomplishes those great things. God knows that we are flawed. God knows we will stumble. God knows we'll be nervous. God knows there'll be awkward situations. We can't do it. But he's still encouraging us to hold on to the hope of Christ. See, the gospel is God's greatness. That we are called to share or attempt. And whenever the end times come, that's my hope that myself, this church, believers around the world will be caught sharing that when their master comes back. They'll be caught so we can share the master's joy. So I told you I would finish the story, and I actually remembered, mostly because it's in my notes. So as I'm having a large offensive lineman lean on me, crying, trying to hold him up, leaning against a tree, mumbling words, trying to figure it out, I say, hey, so what do you think? Like, do you think you want to accept Christ? And in this moment, he presents the most cleanest, clearest gospel presentation I've ever heard in my whole life. And I was like, how did that, what what happened? I know what happened is because I was attempting great things for God. And expecting great things to happen from God. He shares with me, he goes, hey, I know that I'm not worthy of God's love. I was like, this is a good start. That makes sense. I know that I need Christ, and I need Christ because he's the only one that can save me from my sins. Like, this is a great start. This is awesome. And for the longest time, I've struggled believing in that message. But right now, I believe Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And he goes, and he's my Lord and Savior, and I want to make that happen. So he goes, okay, okay. So I just want to, like, right now, I want you to pray with me so I can know that he is my Savior. And I know once I have that prayer that my salvation is forever. I'm in God's hands, and I want to hold on to that for the rest of my life. I was like, okay, you got, who, who are you calling to ministry? Because I think, I think we got this a little mixed up. It was so impactful. And it didn't happen because of my words. It happened because of God's work in his life. But it did point out that there's never an excuse for us not to share Christ. What if I don't know enough? What if I'm going to say the wrong words? I'm not saying we should be ignorant and just spitting things out, but I'm saying if nervousness or knowledge is stopping you, you're the one trying to attempt the great things and then resting on your power, you're taking the God out. But if we're going to attempt great things for God, 
expecting him to do the work, that's when our faith becomes stronger. And that moment, even though it was a complete failure, and I had talked to my <laughs> the youth pastor and other people about, how'd that go? Like, well, he accepted Christ, but I said more, right? Because I knew that God was going to work through that situation if I was just willing to serve him. And now I know when it comes to experiencing the master's joy, I know that he is a Christian. I know that he accepted Christ. I know the angels in heaven are rejoicing because they didn't run away from a 6'4 offensive lineman. And not to give me credit, but to know that that's what God is asking us to do. Be bold. Share your story that God has given you. Share your faith. Let's pray real quick. Dear Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity um, to share uh, your message, God. I pray that as we leave these doors, that we be a church that is willing to be bold about you. God, I pray that as we expect you to come back, as we know you're going to come back, instead of getting locked up in when, we get focused on what we should be doing for you. We love you, Lord. Amen.